will be damned if the same politicians who refused to act then are going to try to come back today. The real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for. When the powerful use their position to bully others, we all lose. A system of justice will be the richer for diversity of background and experience. <laughs> She's a woman! Woo-hoo-hoo. That's very loud. That's very loud. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's me, Miss Cracker. I'm here with my co-pilot, Caitlin, and it's time for She's a Woman. It's a podcast for every human being who looks into the mirror and says, she's a woman, and for the people who love them. Every week, we talk to incredible women of all kinds from all walks of life and invite them to share their stories with you, our incredible listeners, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. This week, I got through that entire intro without stumbling around. Or breathing, really. Or, or yeah. breathing. I just, <laughs> I was diving right through. How are you doing today, Caitlin? I'm okay. It's cold out, very cold. I know. Which is great. For someone like me who wants an excuse to stay inside and not see or do anything. (laughs) You you know what I mean? You thrive in the cold. I do. I love it. You love a snowy day. Best time of year. I feel like I'm like happier and brighter as a person in the cold. Right. Would you agree? Oh, oh, absolutely. I've known you. (laughs) It's like you in the summer and Bob the Drag Queen in the winter. You in the summer, you are so miserable. You're Uh like, I can't even believe I live in America. Yeah. And Bob the Drag Queen in the winter is like, I can't even believe. I live in this country. This yeah. is a, this is a whole <laughs> lie, which I guess yeah. explains why she moved to LA. It, oh, it's true. Right? Warm weather all the time. All the time. It explains why I'm planning to move to Sweden. Oh, and, and one day <laughs> another. You will definitely thrive there. Right. Yeah. By the way, you guys, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to talk about real estate for a minute. <laughs> I know that Caitlin is always looking into real estate in Sweden just to check if she can live, you know. I do. It's one of my hobbies. I like to sit at home and just look at what the rents are in, like, London, uh, Sweden, Edinburgh. <laughs> Edinburgh, yeah. Edinburgh, I got yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I love to look those up and be like, If I make it happen, could Mm -hmm. I move here and afford to live here? And how would I go about doing that? And it's all just a fantasy pipe dream, but... It, it comforts me to know maybe one day yeah. I'm going to get out of America. So what we're telling you, listeners, is there's no dream that's too big. <laughs> Fantasizing is a big part of surviving daily it's life. True. Well, I was I want to ask you one thing before we go into our good news segment for the day. I want to ask you, since I'm dreaming big this year and you've inspired me to read, do well, you okay. have a book that you think that I should read or any couple of books that you think I should be putting next on my list. Well, luckily, I write down all the books I read in a list so I can keep track. Oh my god, it's so nicely organized. (laughs) So I'm looking at my 2020 books list Mm. of ones I read last year. R.I.P. 2020. Yeah. I think you would like Educated by Tara Westover. Okay. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay. It it had quite a viral moment, I feel. All right. Um, It's about this woman who grew up in like a isolated Mormon household and basically didn't have any schooling and then tried to leave her family and try and go to school and how her religious parents like went against that and how she went from being just raised in the middle of nowhere with no outside contact to yeah. getting all these degrees and it's a true story. Oh my god, really? Yeah. I love a true story. I know. And okay. I think you would really like that. So I have that. I can lend it to you. Um I also like White Ivy. Mm. By Susie Yang, which is fiction, but it's about a Chinese immigrant moving to America when she was five and sort of this story about kind of her battle of being a Chinese immigrant and wanting to be kind of this like rich, white, Northeastern person and how she kind of like struggles with that yeah. wanting in her identity. and Those are two great yeah. recommendations. Yeah. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Readers, um, just to let you know, starting on February 1st, probably, I will begin reading those books because I'll be done with my two books for January. Yay! So if you want to join me in reading them, we can talk about those books here because Caitlin will have read it, I'll have read it, and yeah. then you guys wow. will have read it too. We're starting a book club, apparently. Apparently, I didn't, I didn't, know. Know, I didn't know that either. <laughs> Until just now. Anyway, enough about about that and our dreams and aspirations and goals for the year, it's time to talk about some good news. 
I want to dive right into our serious groundbreaking interview for the day, of course, but we have this treat every week and I don't want to let you down. Every week we do a little segment called Here's the Good News, where we share positive stories torn from the headlines. The idea is that they'll bring you, our listeners, a little hope during these difficult times. And this week, our news is not a long tale, it's a short story. Yes. Oh, I just got that. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. (laughs) Okay, Caitlin. Scientists have discovered a brand new oxymoron. A miniature giraffe. That's right. Where most giraffes tower up to 16 feet in the air, making them the tallest mammals on Earth. Earth, there is a small group of small giraffes that can be as short as eight feet tall. That's half the size of a regular giraffe. These unique little guys are living with skeletal dysplasia, or dwarfism, which is rare among wild animals, and this is the first time it has been observed among giraffes. So go to our Instagram, She's a Woman Podcast. I promise we're going to start putting we're gonna, them up. Yeah, we're going to start putting uh, yeah, pictures up. I, uh, yeah. Just remember, we have to put up some of these giraffes because they <laughs> are beautiful creatures. Yeah. And especially, um, you can see how unique they are when you see them next to other giraffes. According to the New York Times, when Michael Brown, a conservation science fellow with the Giraffe Conservation Foundation and the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, Ooh, <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> and his colleagues, <laughs> came across a Nubian giraffe in Uganda in 2015 that was just nine foot, four inches tall. They did a double take. The neck of the giraffe was characteristically long, but its legs were uncharacteristically short. It looked like someone had put a giraffe's head and neck on a horse's body. And since then, they've discovered even smaller giraffes. Aw, I feel like I relate to that body type. I I know. I feel like we both do. (laughs) Yeah. Because when we're walking, I mean, especially... Most drag queens are huge. <laughs> yeah. And you and I, whenever we walk, are when wherever we're on tour and we're walking with other drag queens, I feel like we have to. <laughs> we are the short <laughs> giraffes. giraffes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have to pump our stubby <laughs> little legs in order to keep up. Mm-hmm. Naomi Smalls being. Oh yeah, yes. Or yeah. Carrie Kerning oh, here in New yeah. York. Just Tina Burner. Tina Burner just yeah. Short torso. Bob. Long Bob. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody's huge. Yeah. Everybody's huge except for us. <laughs> anyway, now why is this? good news. For me, anytime we discover diversity in the world, I think it's a beautiful thing. We think of a giraffe as fitting a very specific description and that a beautiful giraffe is a giraffe that checks all the giraffe boxes. But now we find out that there's a whole group of giraffes that look very different and they're beautiful too. And there was another recent article in the Times about albino giraffes, ivory white ones. So it just goes to show that everything we think about a particular animal or anything in this world, the rules can be broken. It reminds us that they're their own species, like humans are, and there's yeah. like different variety, and yeah. you know, they're not just this one image that you picture in the zoo or whatever, you right. know? Right. And that, I mean, that's how humans are, too. Yeah. Right. You're, you're so right. There's so many different kinds of us, and all of those are beautiful and deserve to be seen. Um, and this also reminds us that we still have so much to learn about giraffes at a time when they're in danger. According to the Times, scientists know very little about giraffes compared to other Iconic animals, they said. Iconic. Oh, wow. Hello. <laughs> and these animals are in trouble right now because of poaching and habitat loss. So it's really important that if we want to keep learning new things about giraffes and ourselves, that we protect them. Stories like this make giraffes more real and present to me. And I hope they make giraffes more real and present to our listeners, too. Say giraffes one more time. I giraffe. <laughs> My favorite sentence in that uh, thing was, I, I the way I typed it out, I said, we think of a giraffe as fitting a very, very specific description and that a beautiful giraffe is a giraffe <laughs> that checks all the giraffe boxes. <laughs> and I'm like... I just feel like I've never said or heard the word draft so much I know. in my life. Yeah, it's beginning, and now it's starting to be spelled D-R-A-F, like draft. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we've said it so much. <laughs> yeah. But what's, if you look at this Times article, there's like more like this, and you'd think there'd be articles about other kinds of animals. But no, there's a solid 
page of links to other giraffe articles wow. because they they're so interesting. Yeah. They do so many crazy things and we're still learning about them and like I went into a New York Times link hole just like Maybe learning I about Maybe I should add like a book of drafts to my Okay. my goals book this year. of drafts yeah. is like <laughs> oh I bet it would be a really good one. Right? I'll look some up. Anyway, we're going to get to our interview but first I want us to take a quick break. Okay, we are back, and it's time for today's interview, Caitlin. Yay! I know that y- this is going to be a tough one for you, because <laughs> it involves Beowulf, and that was yeah. not your favorite no. in high school. I hated it. <laughs> yeah, honestly... Like, I just did not like it. I think everybody did, and I think that I enjoyed the old English aspect of it, because I like to learn a new language, but I was not such a huge fan of the story. It was just a story of dudes swinging swords. Yeah, and um, when I was reading it in high school, that was also around the time that they had like this half animated, half real movie come out. Do you remember oh, yes. that? Oh yes, uh huh, with Angelina Jolie. Yeah. CGI. And, yeah. Right. And um, it was like they came out around the same time, and I was like, oh well, I'm gonna go see it since I'm reading this right now. Maybe I'll grasp it more. Yeah. And no, I still hated it. I was like, this movie is so horrible. This story is just about angry men. Like, you know what I mean? And yeah. I just hated it. Hated and it. you're not alone. I think yeah. everyone feels that same way. And I think there's a reason for that. And, our, and the lady that we're interviewing today, she has a reason why she thinks it can be fixed. So let's dive in. Everyone, this is Maria Devana Headley. She is a New York Times best-selling author. Her book, The Mere Wife, was named by the Washington Post as one of its notable works of fiction in 2018. She's written for both teenagers and adults in a variety of genres and forms. But most recently, she published Don't Freak Out, a new translation of Beowulf. That's right, the super long poem that you hated in high school. But she wants you to rethink everything you know about Beowulf. It may not be as dusty and inaccessible as you think. So, Maria, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I am terrific. Thank you for having me on. (laughs) This is great. Oh, yeah. It's an honor because I've just read your new translation of Beowulf and the way you contextualize it and the way you translate it is so beautiful. I kind of want to know the story behind the person that created this. First of all, let's start out easy with like the softball questions. How is your new year starting? What do you feel like having started a new chapter of hope, question mark, and then seeing the world on fire? Yeah, I mean, this has been a week for the books, basically. And it's also a week for anyone who does the kinds of things that I do, which is epic poetry. This is an epic poetry kind of week. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I was celebrating. I was so happy. I was looking at the Georgia results. I was like, yes, 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 yes. And then, no, (laughs) craziness. Um, Yeah. I mean, I I felt like this was, was not terribly surprising, what happened on Wednesday, but it was but it was horrible. I was myself kind of surprised at how how upsetting I I found it seeing seeing all of these awful flags parading into the capital of the U.S. Even though I know that under the surface of the U.S. a lot of that stuff is lurking, yeah. and even on the surface. Um, but it was it was terrible to see those flags being hung in the rotunda, and yeah. terrible to see the violence, and terrible to see people just transgressing against. Uh, against democracy. So for our listeners, Maria writes a lot about men and their pursuit of glory from many different angles. And it's I feel like it's a recurring theme for you. Was that touching those chords in your heart and making you think even deeper about Beowulf and all of that as you were watching? Yeah. I mean, do we have a problem with toxic masculinity in this country? Yes, we have yes. a problem. Yeah. Um, so watching watching that was really almost like seeing 
some of the things that happen in the Beowulf poem coming to life because it's all about status battle. It's all about yeah. trying to get power by fluffing your feathers and stomping up and down in the seat of power. And and pretty much every character in Beowulf does that, including Grendel, who's the monster, but also Beowulf himself, who's the yeah. quote unquote hero of the story. So right. it's just all about, about shaking it <laughs> and yeah. saying, I'm the guy in charge. By the way, stomping up and down and fluffing your feathers is also a perfect description of what drag is. <laughs> so <laughs> It's an interesting thing, given the, the sort of animal kingdom. We, we all do the same thing, like whatever yep. kind of power we're trying to get. You are a woman that is in power now. You have proven yourself in the battle of books as a honored chain mail covered bestseller, but it hasn't always been this way for you. Part of my goal with this podcast is to tell the stories of amazing women from the beginning. And I understand that, you know, though you live uh, in New York now, you grew up in a sled dog ranch in Idaho. I did. I am, yeah, I'm from rural Idaho. I'm from a town, I'm from 10 miles outside of a town of 500 people. So we lived in the middle of the high desert in Southern Idaho in the the like sort of Southwest corner. And my dad raised sled dogs. He had a sometimes up to a hundred dogs living on our property. We raised them unsuccessfully. He just kept breeding them and breeding them and didn't really sell them. (laughs) So we (laughs) consistently had more dogs than a person should have. Um, And he did all kinds of other things too. He was the editor. He started a little small town newspaper. He was, he was a kind of inventor. He was an interesting guy. And my mom is an artist. She's a, she's a painter. So I grew up in like a very American mixture of things like kind of bohemian artistry and weirdo survivalist mountain man culture. Both of those things were my childhood. So you had parents that appreciated the arts and you had a father that loved letters. Was there a moment at which you realized that you loved language and you loved stories or was that kind of just the air you breathed and you never had that aha moment? I think that was my my whole life has been stories. I mean, my, my parents are both very, very interested in story. And my dad was, um, always super, he was a, it was a reader. He was a reader of everything. So all kinds of things came into my, into my childhood sphere. So it was like Jack London combined with Grimm's fairy tales combined. Yes. And all of that is a pretty good example of how I ended up this way. (laughs) During these early years, when you were very young, you had your first encounter with the story of Beowulf. And I, before we talk about some other things, I kind of want to talk about that. In the introduction to your new translation, you said that you sort of encountered Grendel's mother. I believe she was on the cover of a book. She was in a book that I cannot find. I have never found it again. It yeah. was a book that was floating through my childhood in some fashion. And I don't, I have no idea where I encountered it, but it was a kind of compendium of monsters. And there was a picture of this woman coming up out of a pond with a sword. And she was labeled Grendel's mother, but there was no Beowulf in the picture. There was no Grendel in the picture. Who knew? There was no context for her at all. So I thought, okay, well, she must be famous. And yeah. she, must be, she must be the point of whatever story she's from. She must be the hero. And she looked so hardcore. And so she looked like a superhero. You know, she looked like she could have also been a supervillain, I suppose. Right. Um, but I was interested in her as a little kid because I thought, well, there's a girl in this book. This is this is what I want to be. I want to be the girl that comes, comes out of the pond with the sword. Let me do that. It's funny that that relationship began so early and that your relationship to Beowulf began through a woman's story because that would not to spoil the plot of this interview, that would return, that theme would return again and again throughout your life. Now, you ended up going to NYU and you studied dramatic writing. And I kind of wanted to know, where did you want to take dramatic writing at that time? And how did it end up being used in your life? Well, I, so I started out in high school, I was a poet. I was like, okay, I'm going to go and do open mic poetry. That's a way to get my, my stories out there, you know, and, and get an instant audience. So I started writing poetry and performing and somewhere in there, the poems got so long that they turned into plays and I started sending them out and I sent, uh, eventually just kind of randomly sent them to NYU <laughs> and applied and went to Tisch um, and got a scholarship because there was no way I was going there 
on any money that we had because we didn't have any. We had less than, <laughs> we had none. But I, but I also didn't have any stop on my ambition because I just didn't know there were any rules about that. I thought, whatever. I had no idea that anyone had privilege. I just was missing that information. I just thought, well, everyone is yes. like me. They're just sending in their little pile of poems from rural Idaho and and then New York invites them to come. Right. Um, so I, I guess I had the privilege of, of ego. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could, um, with no context. I had no context for that, but I just thought so. So I got to NYU and I was writing plays and I was, and they were, and I, I was doing plays in New York. I was part of a theater company and we were putting them on. And it was somewhere in that mixture of things. I started thinking what the work I really want to do is, is work that can be spoken. Yeah. But I also wanted, I was also really long-winded. So my plays were getting longer and longer and longer until eventually they kind of turned into novels. And then I became a novelist. Yeah. Um, but but the whole time I was thinking, I want these things. I want the rhythm of speaking in in this work. I want I want it to be, I think I think hearing something, hearing poetry read aloud and hearing hearing uh, particularly epic poetry or, or musical, po- musical language, language that has rhythm and meter and and uh, and alliteration is is a different way to get the story into your brain. And in fact, that's yeah. like neurologically proven. Music goes into a different spot. So I was always like, how can I get all the spots? How can I get the story into somebody's brain in more than one way so that it stays? So that it because my goal, of course, has always been to like change the world. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's a small goal, but that's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I like the story of the evolution of your writing because it will show everyone and hopefully our listeners that to dream is not necessarily to know the future or to try to to know the future. You just follow the things that you love constantly and they constantly evolve and that's okay. You didn't uh, fail your young self by not sticking with long poems. You didn't fail your college self by not sticking with theater and plays. You were constantly being true to yourself by following what was next. Exactly. I mean, one of the things that I think has been, I'm 43 now, but when I was in my 20s, because I've been doing this the whole time, I've always pretty much always been a writer. But in my 20s, I had no idea what I was doing. I was I was writing. I published my first book. But I was like, none of my career makes sense. I've done all these different things and they don't make sense. And now, 20 years later after that, and I just kept doing all these different things, which sometimes didn't make sense still. And now it all makes sense. Like now I'm like, oh, I'm OK. I have Beowulf translation. It's an epic poem. I'm reading it aloud. It's being read aloud all over the world. And now it makes sense, but it took a long time for it all to look like one path. <laughs> it yeah. looked like nine paths, but it, it wasn't. It was the same path. The path knows what it's doing, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's, as they say in Beowulf, weird. That's fate. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2006, you, you, the scene changed for you a little bit with a book called The Year of Yes, which is, for our listeners, a comic memoir of a year when you said yes to everyone who asked you out on a date. Now, this book was a bit of a sensation. You did every TV show from The Today Show to Keith Olbermann, and the book was written about and talked about everywhere from The New York Times to Elle Magazine to NPR. I remember hearing about it on NPR at the time because I'm an NPR junkie. I kind of want to talk to you about what it was like to be sort of catapulted into the spotlight for someone like you. What what did that experience feel like? It was a really strange experience, I have to say. I was, the first television interview I ever did was on the Today Show um, with Katie (laughs) Couric. And it was at like six in the morning and it was the day my book came out. It was my first book. I had no the ne- the world had never seen me before. I had been like about my business. <laughs> and then right. suddenly I was on, you know, national television with millions of people seeing my face, which was really jarring. It was a really jarring experience because what you learn when you do something like this is I know you know, <laughs> is that yeah. um, is that having millions of people suddenly suddenly see you and see a simplified version of you that not the whole person because they can't see the whole person. Um, right is 
it, it, it's both troubling and kind of freeing. You're like, I have my whole other self that's behind this. And then here's the like 12 line version of my soul right. that I'm putting out onto national television. So the, um, so the version of me that was the year of yes, which is me is like the, the, but it's a funny book. It's completely comedic. It's like comedic right. with little bits of moving stuff. There's love in it. There's all kinds of different encounters with the with amazing people of mostly of New York City. Um, so it's really a love story about New York City, about how much I love New York and how much I fell in love with New York when I moved there. But it was my publisher at the time was like, why are why aren't you more normal? <laughs> Can't you just be? And every girl, can't you be the girl next door? And I was like, I don't even know what next door means. We didn't have any next door neighbors. I'm from a sled dog ranch. I don't know how to even talk about that. <laughs> and right. so it was this very strange thing to have my weird soul um, on display for a lot of people who were not expecting that person to show up with this story, the story of, of saying yes to a bunch of dates. Because, because in the culture it would seem to people to the sort of mainstream audience, particularly in 2006, when this book came out, that only normal people deserve love. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that was my point was that isn't true. That's crazy. Right. But yeah. um, so the book was pretty transgressive in that way. And it caused a lot of upset. Like some people really, really felt angry angry about it because they thought she shouldn't get love. Like she has really short hair. She should. And I thought that you had to grow out your hair and look really femme to have love. And I'm real. I'm a very femme looking person, but I had really short hair. I had a pixie cut and that yeah. pixie cut galvanized people. It made them feel so angry. And I was like, oh, the world is really sexist in a way that I had not experienced to that, to that degree. I just didn't, I didn't know that the entire internet was going to be talking about how, whether or not they liked my smile. Um, I was like, I'm a writer. Oh no. What? I didn't know that I had to be really pretty. I'd never felt upset about my looks until I suddenly was all over television. And, and, you know, like, I like how I look and, but it was, um, but in that moment, it was shocking to people to see someone who looks like me with short hair and tattoos and like, um, yeah. and not, and not girl next door on, on television saying I too can find love and I am worthy of love, which I think is something that I think all of us deal with when we're making our way in the world, if we're not just cookie cutter. And even if we are cookie cutter, we feel this way. Do you feel like I do that? That is an experience that women authors suffer much more than male authors. The having to fit a certain look as well as being able to sp <laughs> write, speak through words, you know? Um, yes, I, it's, you know, as my career has gone on, it's things have changed and I have changed. But in the beginning of, of my career, especially because I was writing memoir, because I was writing something that was about my own experience, it was really like the way I looked was, was part of the package. And it was, right. and it was a part of the package that was wide open for judgment. And even as I started writing fiction, people still had feelings about how I look. They were like, is she too pretty to write this because it's smart? Is she not pretty enough to write this because it's, um, because it's about looks? If I was talking about how it felt to look a certain way, people were like, oh, she's not, she wouldn't even be able to know that because she's a woman who looks, because she has brown hair, because she, you know, I mean, people, people really entwined it with my physical self to a degree. And of course, what a person's physical self does impact their experience of the world hugely. Right. Um, so, so on the one hand, that's that's relevant. On the other hand, the the like too pretty, not pretty enough aspect of this is a weird thing, and it's a weird thing when you're like trying to be an author as a woman. What happens is that you you essentially have to like leap from being very young to being a dignified older woman. <laughs> like you don't get right. to have the middle year where you're just in the world. You have to, cause, cause neither you can be like a young prodigy or, or an older woman who has dignity, but if in the middle, like the sexy thirties, no, you can't have them. You're it's too challenging to be out in the world in, in those years as, as both a brain and a body for, for society, yeah. for society. Like people feel really threatened by it. So far in this podcast, we've talked to comedians and writers and, businesswomen. And it's so funny that this theme 
the too pretty and not pretty enough theme keeps coming up again and again as part of women's experience of the world that you have to look like you're expected to look whatever that means. And it's this moving target. You are not going to fit any cookie cutter looks. I know your author photos. You're not a cookie cutter person. You're not a cookie cutter life story either. I want to, while you were talking, I was thinking about this. I heard in passing that you were for a short time, a pirate negotiator in maritime shipping. Is that a thing that's true? That's true. (laughs) I just like talk about not being cookie cutter. Can you talk a little bit about how that came to be and what that experience was like? I can. I mean, this was an amazing thing that I have actually, I've never written about it. Um, I Hello, was, I'm asking for it. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's like, it's one of those things where you're, your life just goes about its business. And then sometimes you end up in places where you're like, how, how did I end up here? Even when it's you and you know that your life is weird like this. So I was, yeah. I was uh, just out of NYU. I was a playwright. I was like newly dubbed, you know, (laughs) New York playwright. And I moved to Seattle because I fell in love and I was going to get married to, um, to the man that I did marry, um, my former husband and he and I, he was in Seattle. So I moved there. Um, and I didn't have a job and I had no health insurance and I was freaking out. I was so broke. And so I was like, okay, temp, I'm going to temp. And I got signed up with a temp agency and, walked in the first place I walked into was La Leche so it was a breastfeeding training company that did not want to hire me because they felt like I didn't understand anything about breastfeeding which was not untrue I, I did not understand anything about breastfeeding okay fair so the next so they didn't want me <laughs> and they were like no um they handed me a giant breast and asked me to name the ducts and I was like I don't know I don't know the names of these ducts so the next job that I walked into was in a boat company down in the like uh, Lake Union dry dock area. And it was a boat company that did research vessels and yeah. um, yachts and all kinds of things, all kinds of some, some big ships, some like more fancy ships all over the world. And I walked in and everybody was in a battle at the time that I walked in. The whole company was fighting with everyone else. And my boss, the guy who had hired me to be his secretary, was in the process of quitting. But I needed a job. So I was like, I can just do his job. (laughs) And I ended up sitting in the middle of the floor in a pile of files and he was and he quit. So I got his job, which was managing all of these research vessels. I knew nothing about anything about this. I knew nothing about boats. I knew nothing about ships. I knew nothing. But I was a playwright. So I pretended that I knew a lot. I started (laughs) putting monologues about that sound like straight out of Moby Dick. I was like, that's all I had. (laughs) So yeah, so I so I worked at this company for about four years, during which time I ended up managing these 300 foot long ships all over the world. And I was traveling all over the world, um, getting jobs for the boats. And it was a company where the ships would do anything. We were, that was kind of our slogan. We'll do it if you won't, which meant that we were always in dangerous places. We were always Love doing that. things we weren't supposed to be doing. And my ships were always in pirate waters. So I was not a full-time pirate negotiator at all. It was just that occasionally my ships would have problems and be taken. (laughs) So that's, that was some of my job. Part of my job was talking on the sat phone to the guys who'd taken the ship. It doesn't need to be full time to be impressive. (laughs) I mean, it was a stressful, it was a stressful job. It was stressful and also really enlightening because part of the job also involved, and this was in the early aughts. So it involved DC. It involved going and lobbying for appropriations. So it was it was a job that gave me a lot of insight into what's going on today and into to the way that that politics has worked for a long time. Yeah. Lots of like shady dealings with Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska, for example, who is now dead, oh, wow. but who was very famously always had his hands open for bribes and the oh, boat wow. business uh, works with him a lot. Worked with him a lot back in the day. So that was like. It was really enlightening. It was really the underbelly of America because the shipping industry works the same way it has always worked. Yeah. As in, it's still the 1800s. <laughs> like yeah. you, there, the law of the sea is, is really old school. And it's not, I, I would have thought that we, you know, we had just like come across into 
to the 21st century. I thought we were there. We were not there. We were 200 years in the past roaming around and there were still pirates and everybody was acting like it was the 1800s. And it was like, I mean, it, obviously this impacts my writing because it, it made me go, oh, everything has always been the same. This is right. I keep thinking we're like radically changing and the structures of gender discourse are changing. Nope, we haven't changed. We're still the same. <laughs> we're like the way that power works is still the same. You hand an envelope full of cash to somebody and you, you get what you want. And it's yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was really enlightening and interesting thing to do. And also really, I mean, I was I think I was talking about it the other day because I this Beowulf translation talks from the point of view of like kind of bro culture. And yeah. that was a period of my life in which I was a bro. I right. The only way for me to do that job was to be one of the guys. So I had to be the girl that the only, I was like, there were like two women in that whole business. So I was one of them, but I was, I also had to just hang out with large groups of men at yeah. strip clubs. And um, that's where all the business was done. <laughs> now you're making me think about the translation and some of the things that you're saying are drifting into what, what I wanted to talk about, which is you project this feeling that Beowulf is not that long ago and that the text is not that far away and we can get there. There are many translators that think that Beowulf should be written in a very formal, poetic way. And you have a little bit of a different take on it. And I wanted you to talk about why, what was the setting for Beowulf to be heard? And why do you think the translation should be a little bit different than like Tolkien was saying? The, there's lots of theory about what Beowulf is. Some people think that Beowulf, the poem that we have, is a transcription of an oral performance that somebody right. was like sitting in the audience writing it down, which is, I think, true. I think that's what happened here. The way that the poem is written, it has like all kinds of recapping of information for drunk people in the audience, in my opinion. Yes. You're, you're standing up on a table, you're performing this poem and you're telling the story and periodically you have to stop because somebody is too drunk or you have to stop because somebody is like screaming their own story from the other end of the mead hall, which is right. you know, basically it's a beer hall. So my feeling about this poem has always been, you know, it's an important poem. It's this like big epic. It's the only one like it in old English. And so it's special. And people have felt that because it's special, it needs to sound dignified and it needs to sound kind of noble, which is what J.R.R. Tolkien felt about it. And right. so his translation is kind of, it sounds a lot like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it has a very, right. the, the time of man, it feels like that. And his yeah. own work came a lot from that. He was really inspired by Beowulf. My translation is much more like you are a bunch of people sitting in a beer hall, everybody's drunk, and a guy is standing on a table shouting, oh my God, bro, you have to hear my story. Oh my God, you can't believe what happened to me. And he's shouting and shouting over the crowd. And he is using rhyme and using alliteration in order to make it something that people can shout along with. So right. yeah, so the tone of this is like a story. It's like a big, in my translation, the tone of it in other people's translations, not always so much this way, but my translation is like a big bro story. And including like lots of dives into other characters' perspectives. I was interested in, in looking at the depiction of the world of the like sixth century, which is what the story is about, but also, at, also looking at the way that we still have those threads in our society because they were, they came from there. It's interesting what you were talking about with working in the shipping industry and realizing the sort of bro dynamics that still exist, the battles, the exchange of cash and goods. Those are the issues that run through today and through Beowulf. And so if you can stop thinking about it as being in the sixth century and scoot a little closer to it, you can get close to the story. And you really, I think you really do that with the language that you use. I personally, when I was listening to it, tried to imagine someone shouting this story to me in a bar, in a meat hall. I mean, as a drag queen, I know what it's like to try to tell stories to drunk people. <laughs> I know I recognize a lot of the, the ploys, like especially doubling back to be like, now remember this happened. So that's why this next thing goes on is because you are screaming at people that are half there. And I love <laughs> 
I love reading the story in that way. It makes it feel completely different. I loved when you, you read the beginning of the of the Beowulf poem for this group reading that we did. And it was so lovely to imagine you standing on the bar. I mean, that's what I was doing as I was watching you do your reading. I was like, this is, it's different, but it's absolutely appropriate because the narrator of the poem is, is a poet. The narrator is the storyteller. So I think it's absolutely like drag queen narrator is, is a good way to look at this, honestly. (laughs) Well, okay. So that, that's leads me to another question, which is that you have a keen interest in the stories of women But hello, Beowulf is all about men in the eyes of many people. So can you tell me why this is a story that interests you? Why you feel there are women's stories in this? For me, it's interesting too. This is a wild card thing that I did this because I was interested in Grendel's mother and I wrote The Mere Wife, which is a novel from the perspective of all of the female characters in Beowulf. That was the whole point of that novel. I was like, I'm going to tell the women's stories. So I wrote that novel and then out of that novel, it became at some point into my brain, somebody in a QA and a asked me when my translation was coming out. And I thought, what? I'm not going to translate it. And then a few days later, I thought, yes, I am. I am going to translate it, <laughs> which was the crazy thing to do. Like, but a really interesting thing to do because it led me to looking at the entirety of the story rather than just at the female character and characters and their, their journeys. I started looking... Um, at all of it. And so the the women in Beowulf are very important. Grendel's mother is the second big battle and she's the battle that really tests Beowulf. She's, she almost wins, she almost kills him. And the thing about that battle that's so amazing is that Beowulf in the story is about 18 years old. He's like, he's a kid and he's a, you know, very, lots of ego, lots of sort of brass balls is how he's described. Um, yeah. But he, he doesn't, he doesn't have any experience really to back it up. And Grendel's mother has been queen for 50 years in her own kingdom. She is as old as the king that Beowulf has come to help. So she's probably 70. And right. so they, and they have a battle. They fight each other hand to hand and she almost wins. And she's, this is an old, so thinking about it that way was really interesting to me to think about that an old woman essentially is battling this teenage boy who's the best warrior in the world and she yeah. almost kills him. So thinking about about power in that culture, that really gives you a different sense of of what is normal even. Like she's it doesn't seem super crazy that she's that strong to people. Yeah. So that's an interesting element of it, but also the other women in the story are wrangling power from behind, which I think is something that's been very familiar throughout the culture of patriarchy yeah. as it forever um wrangling power (laughs) and saying no honey you're in charge you're totally in charge actually though um here's what's happening so so the the major king's wife whale is now is wrangling her king and making him do what she wants him to do um with the language that's in the poem so i translated it that way as as though we we were like getting some of her like subtext as we're listening and yeah and the other women in the poem, there are a bunch of women in the poem that are mentioned. And usually they're, I mean, they're mentioned as part of the war culture. They're they're having to deal with often loss. Like they're 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 bearing the cost of war. They're bearing, like, this is a culture that's at war all the time. Everybody is fighting all the time for status for gold and trying to claim each other's kingdoms and women are being traded back and forth and and being like the peace bridges the they're the like bridge of brides is happening throughout the culture so several times you get stories about women who've been traded and who are like oh shit everything is fucked up now there's a giant mess surrounding me my husband is battling with my brother now And you get, I think, something that's really interesting in the Old English poems. You get, um, not just in Beowulf, but a couple of other places, too, you get the sense of agonizing burden that these women have upon them in an attempt to, like, hold peace, but they can't hold peace because the culture, it values gold and status over safety. So, I mean, that's so akin to where we are now. I mean, it's late capitalist discussions, but like we're, we're still there. So I wanted to talk about the burden of, of pain and grief and suffering, not just on women in, in our society, but, um, 
certainly on women, certainly on women, children, marginalized people of all kinds. Everyone who's ever been othered is underneath the boot of Beowulf, you know? And right. so I wanted to, I wanted to look at it from underneath. I wanted to see, see the story from underneath. And some of that is actually, I mean, it is in the poem. You, you get little glimpses of it. So I, so I pushed on those glimpses so that we could really see the cost of war. As you read the translation, you, and having read your introduction, I saw how you opened up those glimpses into the women heroes and supervillains or supervillain slash heroes that are in the story. But here's here's my question for you. And I mean, I know the answer and I think I know your answer, but I, I want to ask anyway. Here we are. It's 2021. You have translated Beowulf and opened up all of these new facets of it for us to look into. Should this be the last translation? Have you finally nailed it and now we're done? Should we close the door on it because you did it? <laughs> I mean, no. What I hope I've done here, as much as I could do it, because this was my goal, my goal was to hold the door open because I want... This is, a, this is a poem that has been translated in published translations almost exclusively by white people and almost exclusively by white men, although there are female translators. There, there have been, you know, a dozen female translators or so over the years. Okay. But what I want, of course, is for everyone who's interested in it to, tr everyone who wants to. I mean, if you want to translate Beowulf, I want you to do it. You know, I want, I want people to see that this is open to them, that this is not just, not just a story about and not just a story meant for and meant for the filtering of, old white men. Like I wanted, I want, I want people of color to be in this, in this translation corpus. I want those perspectives because yeah. I think you can see things in this, in the, in the texts that have lasted, that have built societies. And this is one of them. Yeah. This text has only been in English translation for about 200 years, but during those 200 years, we have seen Beowulf all over um, everything. I mean, it's yeah. a really influential text. So one of the things that I'd like to see would be a lot of different perspectives on the ways this text has influenced um, power and influenced societal structure, because that's the only way to change it. The only way to change these big structures that people justify by saying, this is how it has to be because the myth said it has to be this way. The only way to change it is to go in and say, here's Here's a here's a more expansive view of what this means. Here's a here's a wider mythology. Here's a here's a more um, critically analyzed canon. And yeah. I, I'm certainly not the end all of critical analysis at all. There there's yeah. like tons of gender analysis to be done in this poem. There's tons of class analysis. You can apply poems like this to everything. That's why they last because they're really interesting. They're about humans, yeah. you know. So we're, so I want you know, ideally, like every, every human, <laughs> this is, yeah. this is everybody. We could, we could all touch it and have, and have a unique perspective on it. And that's what I think is, um, is often missing in things that have been really held tightly to the establishment. Like this one has, this is like, this is our text. And I, I just don't think that's the case in terms of like a small group of people, it belongs to them. No, I don't, right. I don't believe that that's, appropriate and I don't and I not only do I not believe it's appropriate I also think it's not interesting like you, right. you end up with a situation where you get the same kind of translation over and over again and the same kind of perspective over and over again which leads to a very narrow story as opposed to a wide-ranging story about here are these interesting characters here are these interesting lines here here's a whole novel based on the on one line you know that could happen too all kinds of things could happen with a story like this and of course there are there are so many other stories to look at, but I, but I always, I always want massive expanded perspective rather than a narrow perspective that comes yeah. from having just the same kind of person doing this. I love the idea of you, the image that you gave of holding open the door for everyone to sort of rush in. And I'm seeing the kind of uh, dragon's treasure, like everyone can take what interests them from the trove. I really encourage listeners to give this a whack and if you thought that Beowulf was distant and dusty and musty and manly, then I think that this might be the key for you to open it up and, and get close to it. And if you are, if you just know that you absolutely are not going to do Beowulf, I think that you should look at any of this author's 
books because there's so much to choose from. Go to your bookstore and there's fiction, there's nonfiction, there's memoir, there's <laughs> stuff for teens and adults. And coming out from FSG next year, the story of a pirate negotiator. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do, I do want to ask, cause I always ask everyone, is there something that is sort of stewing on the back burner, something that you want to do next and that it, it 2021 might be the year to start on it? Oh, I'm so, I'm actually so excited. I have so many things. I, there I'm is sure. actually a short, you know, <laughs> there's yeah. a, there's a short story collection coming from FSG next year, I think. Okay. Um, which will be fun. And that's like a wide, a wide range of stories. It's a bunch of things I've published over the past few years and also some new stuff. But what I'm working on right now in my secret self, I'm, I'm confessing my secret. I've been working on, I fell back into poetry because of doing this Beowulf translation. So I've been working on a kind of long epic poem. <laughs> Oh my God. That's, so you've heard it see. here first. I know you have because nobody even knows this. This is like my, the only people who know this are like my one and a half year old son and my partner who lurks here with me and has to know everything. <laughs> Oh my God. But, uh, I like, you're telling your partner, like, I have to be open with you. I am working on poetry. Don't hate me. <laughs> that's exactly right. I had to confess. I was like, I'm working on an epic poem. Don't judge me. Don't even, don't look over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> And the last thing I want to ask you that just sort of came to my mind is, as I said, a lot of our listeners are young women and um, not to praise the podcast, but I think they're bright young women. And I was wondering if you could tell a young aspiring woman who wants to be an author, who wants to be a writer, what's a piece of advice or wisdom that you would have liked to pass down to your younger self? I think there's there's such a temptation to try to be perfect. You think that you you could, it's something you think you can achieve perfection. Like when you're in your twenties, I thought I could. I was like, each of these has to be perfectly polished. Each thing I publish, it's going to matter so much that it's perfect. And really, what matters is getting it out into the world. Like get your story out there and let your story grow to the next thing, as opposed yeah. to like staying stuck in the same story, stuck in the same story, trying to polish it, trying to polish it. Like the thing about growth and the thing that makes your writing better is letting it go, like put it out, let it go, let it go and grow and grow and grow. Because like growing as a writer means that you can have like massive revelations and breakthroughs that you can't have if you just keep feeling nervous about showing your work to the world. Like, yeah. I mean, people will judge you and it's scary to be judged. And I mean, I've <laughs> definitely been judged. People have sometimes really hated me, but that was also not the end of the world. It was fine. Like I, you, you get through it. You get through people saying no, no, no. And then you go on and you're like, well, now I'm doing this. Here I go. So it's always about like getting back on it when somebody judges you, but you have to like have the bravery to go out and let your work be judged before you can, before you can have the triumphant experience of, of kicking ass, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So That's yeah, perfect. you just have to have the bravery to be out to be out there with your work. That's so funny because whenever anyone asks me their advice for drag, I'm like, leave the house. Like when you put on <laughs> yes. makeup, don't just sit in your I mean, this is pre-COVID, of course. I was like, don't just sit in your apartment in your or in your bedroom and be in makeup. Have the bravery to go show the world so that if you get criticism, you can get over it. And then if you get praise, you can enjoy it because that's what the great big world is out there for. So I want to thank you so, so much for joining us today. And your book has already seen so much uh, celebration and success, but I, I hope that our listeners will jump on and uh, join the, the party because it's really, truly wonderful. And I, it was a pleasure to read. What a pleasure to have you love it. I'm so lucky. <laughs> thank you for having me on. And shablam, there was our interview with Maria Devana Headley, who is very fun and very bright and has a really remarkable life. It's really interesting to hear about the shipping career that she kind of had and how it it literally sounds like parts of the 
Caribbean oh, <laughs> or something, absolutely. you know, and I just never think about that and how little it has changed from the 1800s. Yeah. You know? And she's like, yeah, some things <laughs> never change. Yeah. Like, people uh, want stuff and power and uh, out on the seas, there's no law. Yeah. So now I have what my career is going to be after drag. I'm going to be a pirate negotiator. Okay. Yeah. It's, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, first, I was thinking barista, but now just to the left of that. Yeah. Pirate negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, loved that interview. But now it's time for us to take a little break. Okay, we're back. First of all, I want to say this. If you liked your time with us today, make sure to subscribe to the podcast, rate it, and review it. We love reviews. In fact, we love them so much. We're going to read some of our favorite reviews right here at the end of the show. Caitlin, do you have a favorite review for this week? I do. This is from user. Love my car. Hate this app. <laughs> it says, I'm a massive crackerhead, so I am an easy sell on Ms. Cracker hosted podcasts. Full disclosure, I had low expectations that it was going to be sticky and the guests would be meh. Turns out it's amazing. You two are doing such a great job. I'm loving it. My favorite new find. This is funny to me because they say they're a massive cracker head and then they go on to say they had low expectations yes. and it's like if you're a true cracker fan you have low expectations i guess yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then i feel like we changed their mind they listened and they yeah. were like this is great this is true art yes you know? it is <laughs> like i say terry gross look out because this is not fresh air this is fresh air for women or <laughs> Oxygen, as I like to say. Okay. <laughs> but enough about that. It's time, Caitlin, for my favorite part of the show, the credits. <laughs> this podcast was produced by Caitlin Gretham, and then I did it. The cast includes me and also Caitlin, and it is distributed by the amazing Studio 71. And that's the sound of the garbage truck outside. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Pressing trash from New York City into a hole in the Bronx. Um, very lovely bones. Okay, so thank you for joining us today. Make sure to tune in next Monday for another exciting episode. And remember, if you ever feel down, all you have to do is look in the mirror and say, She's a woman! And I'll be with you. There, we did a good one. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>